finished grading PA5 and, and no additional surprises or comments really be beyond what we talked about yesterday. So that's all good. So any questions before we just keep going through this? Yeah. Go over heaps, yes, heaps are definitely coming. <laughs> um, what else? All right, so how far did we get here? We, dynamic programming, okay, so, um, so that's PA5, right? And we talked a couple of days ago about caching results, how you make a save structure of some kind, store your calculations in there so you can avoid recursing, that's the essence of of the technique. Is that all of it? Just storing stuff you don't have to do it again? Pretty much, yeah. Um, but but the problems that we were looking at in that area were, were these problems that tend to have um, repeated instances of sub problems. Right? So two pieces. One uh, kind of recursive structure where f of n can be written as f of some other thing smaller than n. And two, a case where you're going to continually recalculate those earlier values. So your um, your factorial example Right. This would not be a good candidate for dynamic programming because if we're trying to calculate 10 factorial, we're going to have to calculate 9 and 8 and 7, but we're only going to do those things once. Right. So, so saving these temporary results doesn't really help us because we're never going to call them again. Knapsack, to calculate max val for a capacity of 10, we're probably going to end up calculating max val for a capacity of 4 multiple times, right? maybe thousands of times. So that's where saving in an array can improve your performance. That's when you throw in dynamic programming. Um, all right, well, let's do heaps next since we had a request for heaps, and then we'll go back and finish with sorts. Um, yes? Yeah, um, just real quick before you talk mm -hmm. about dynamic programming. If you want to save your values, without using a global array or a global structure, do you always have to pass it to the same array structure, or is there a different way of doing that? Um, you can either have a global, or you can pass it around to each of your functions so that it can update it. Um, I think those are really the two main ways. Okay. So, like, typically people don't like global variables. Mm -hmm. So is it an exception in this case, or is it always a better practice to be passing it around? You know, I was talking to a student at another school and they were just told by their TA that um, next time they used a global variable they were going to get a zero. <laughs> so I don't know if that's like a general rule um, or if it's something in particular that's going on in that course. But um, you don't want to use globals in a sloppy way. Okay, That's generally going to be frowned upon. So for example, um, you're trying to find, well, let's think of an older example. Um, I don't know, so you're writing a program that's going to add up grades, right? And um, so you typically pass the name of a student and the course they took and their grade to a function and it's going to do some accumulation, right? Um, so you could have a global variable called student name and you could copy the student name into that and you could call your function and it could read the name from that global variable. That's pretty clearly a, a sloppy use of a global, right? You're really trying to pass information to a function and you should pass it as an argument. Um, something like this where we want um, one array that basically every instance of the function is going to use the same data to me, it actually makes more sense to do that as a global. Um, but it's possible that some places would say, you know, no, you're an evil programmer for doing that. <laughs> In which case, you could just pass it as another parameter. But if you've got lots of different functions all trying to use the same thing and you insist on passing this as a parameter to every single function that might want to access it, 
that feels like that feels sloppier to me than just saying you know here's a global variable because it's really you know one instance of this that every single thing that's running should access um, so I don't know I'm, I mean throughout your your careers you're going to have to kind of play by the rules of whoever is is writing your checks um, and so you go to one place and they'll have a style guide and it'll say you got to put your curly bracket after one space after the name of the function right and you'll go somewhere else and they'll say well your curly bracket has to go on the beginning of the next line but you can't indent it you have to indent the lines after the curly bracket and everybody has their own way of doing things right <coughs> some place may say you can only use variables that start with vowels I don't know um, I have a question about the structures and globals though. So yeah. Structures kind of like on the line there. If you just write a structure um, at the very start, right after your include sections, but you don't name it, so it's not initialized. It's not very very right. A structure is is a declaration of a type of variable. So struct. Uh, right. That's not declaring a variable. Like right here. Like right, like val or something. Now that's become a global variable. That's become a global variable if this is outside of, of any function. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that by itself, just declaring a structure, that's got to be done outside a function if you want multiple functions to access it. But it's not considered a variable, so that's that's not being a global. So yeah, the safe answer to, to is it an exception, are you allowed to use globals, is really just kind of depends on your environment. And for me, you know, if you don't go crazy with globals, I'm okay with things like uh, dynamic programming, save array. Um, all right, any other questions around that? All right, so let's, let's talk about heaps. So, um, Two types of heaps, right? Max heap and min heap. And they're pretty much the same concepts. <coughs> Max heap things are larger at the top, min heap things are smallest at the top. So, um, so let's just talk about max heaps. But everything applies to min heaps also. So max heap, what's the main characteristic that a max heap needs to satisfy? What's the heap property? Every parent has to be bigger than both children, right? Um, so that's what we call the heap property. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is it's got to look like a heap. So that looks like a heap because every level is filled in down to the bottom level, and the bottom level is filled in from left to right. So it's got the heap shape. If I throw a node over here, that's no longer got the heap shape because the bottom level is not filled in strictly from left to right. We're missing a node right here. But if you also had a node there, that's a heap. And so is this, because the bottom level is filled in from left to right. So max heap has to have the heap shape, and every node has to satisfy the heap property. Okay, if you keep those straight, you'll always be drawing heaps. You'll be able to identify heaps. So now the whole challenge is, what do we do with them? If it's a max heap, the largest entity is always sitting up here at the root. So if you want to find the largest value in a max heap, just grab the root. Okay, when you delete the root, you got to put something in its place. So what goes in the place? Let me make a heap here so we can have specifics. So is that a heap? Yes. Right. Every node's bigger than its two children, and it's got the heap shape. Okay. So what's the largest element in this heap? It's always going to be the root. 
So if we want to remove the largest element, we get rid of the root. What do we put in its place? Yes, yeah, so the bottom row, rightmost element, that's the 12. Move that up here. And then it's probably not a heap anymore. Because the smaller things are down here, the larger things are up here. We just took one of these smaller things and moved it way up to the top of the pile. So it's probably not a heap at this point. So we do this thing called down heaping, which says basically see if this satisfies the heap property. If it doesn't, what do we do? Move it. Where do we move it? Which way? Yeah, so we're going to move it down, but we're going to swap it with the largest. So that's how you know whether you're swapping with the left or the right. So, so look at 12. It violates the heap property. Swap it with, in this case, the 30. So 30 goes there. This becomes the 12. Still violates the heap property, so we're going to swap it again with the largest. So move it down in place of the 15. And there's nothing under there, so it satisfies the heap property. So there's our heap. So now it looks like 30, 15, 25, 10, 12, 20, 22, 8, and 9. So there's two things we're doing with heaps. We're removing and we're inserting. Okay, removing, we're always going to remove the root, in which case you take the last element in the heap, put it up to the root, and down heap. If you want to insert, you kind of do the opposite. So let's insert the number 17. So put it into the next spot that preserves the heap shape, right? which means it's got to go right here because that's next to the rightmost element. And then we upheap. So upheap, you basically look at the parent, see if it satisfies the heap property. If not, do the same thing. Swap with the largest child and then upheap again. So 12 is not bigger than 17. It violates the heap property. So swap with the largest and only child. And now look at its parent. And that violates the heap property. So swap with the largest child. And look at that node's parent, 30. That satisfies the heap property. So now we got a heap again. Okay, so you know what a heap is, you know what the heap property is and the heap shape. You know how to remove the root, replace it and down heap. You know how to insert a new number and up heap. There's one more thing you want to know, and that's heapifying. So heapifying is how we create a heap to begin with. And the idea is you've got a set of numbers, you want to turn it into a heap, you just go ahead and you write them down in whatever order they appear. In the heap shape, but with no expectation that this is a heap yet. Right, so you've got input data and you just sort of fill it in, in this shape, and now you say, well, is it a heap or not? So heapifying is this peculiar process we start with so, so there's an order to these elements, right? We start on the bottom row, and we move from right to left. Then we go to the previous row, move from right to left, go to the previous. So there's an order, right? It's the order in which we'd be inserting. So we go through that order, and we check each node and see if it satisfies the heap property. So 18 has no children, that's fine. 4 has no children, that's fine. 10, 19, and 60 have no children, those are fine. 40 has two children, does it satisfy the heap property? So that's fine. 12 has children, does it satisfy? Okay, so we have to swap with the largest child, and if this had children, we'd have to continue to down heap, right? So now 19 is fine. What about 50? Right, so we have to swap with the largest child, and 50 has no children, so that's fine. And then we come up to 20, and 20 violates the heap property, so we have to swap with 60. So that becomes 60. That becomes 20, and now we check 20. 20 is not bigger than both children, so swap with the largest child. And 20 has no children, so it satisfies the heap property, and we're done. And we took our 
kind of randomly organized set of initial data <coughs> and turned it into a heap. That's everything you need to know about heaps, I think. <coughs> you should know how to store them in arrays, but I don't ask you that on the test. But it's a good thing to know. <coughs> so any questions about that? Uh, I'm just curious. Can you give us an example of like a real-world application of heaps? Sure. Um, Let's see. I've given you the operating system one before. Let me see if I can think of a better one. Um, <coughs> trying to think of a game. Well, let's say um, let's say you're making a chess playing game, okay, and you have a series of potential moves. And you'd like to know which move is is um well, that's a bad example. Hmm. Let's say you're, you're writing Rogue, okay, so a dungeon crawling game, and you have a series of monsters, right? And you want to organize your monsters from strongest to weakest, right? So you throw them into a heap, where the value here is the strength of the monster, right? And you're going to throw a monster into a room with the player and if they defeat that monster then you want to put the next most powerful player into the room okay so you have a heap of monsters um, and periodically every five moves you create a new monster at random right so player enters a room you grab the root you throw it into the dungeon and you want to be able to grab the next most powerful monster, so you're going to take, you know, this, put it up there, down heap, so now the root's the next monster that you're waiting for. Um, and they kill the first monster, and so you grab the new root, and you put that in the room, and you find a new root for there. And after five moves, it's time to create a new monster, so you create a new monster, and it's a wraith, right, and you put it down here. And the wraith is the most powerful monster that they've encountered yet, right, so when you upheap, that's going to move up to the root. And what was the most powerful monster is sitting in that second position now. So when it's time to introduce a new monster, you'll put that wraith in, and then that previous most powerful one will go up. So it's, it's this ordered list that lets you basically put new things into it, and it always keeps the order, and you can always grab the, the top entry. So the, the computer science example is, is job processes. Right, so you organize your jobs by priority level, and after a job has finished, you remove it from the heap, it's gone. Um, but if somebody else comes along, an operator comes along while jobs are running and says, hey, I want to run this program, and it's got really high priority, right, it's got to move to the top of the heap, or the operating system has to do something and it needs a process. Um, and so you typically have a heap to implement the priority queue, process jobs in order, but do the <coughs> higher priority ones first. Thank you. Okay. Um, would this be one of the <coughs> problems we would see that we would have to write down specifically, like go through the heap process? Yeah, I'm going to ask you to do heap things. I was going to say, like, more so, like, show the actual work of the tree versus the programming side of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so more doing this kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Could you go over quick sort again? Because I have some difficulty going on okay. myself. Are we good with are we good with heaps? Mm -hmm. Okay. And min heap is the same thing, but you know the heap property says you gotta be smaller than both children. Everything else is the same. All right, so yeah, let's go on to sorts. Um, and let's start with quick sort because that takes the longest, which is odd. So, random numbers.
All right, so you start with an array or a list of, of numbers that you're trying to quick sort. Um, so quick sort is a divide and conquer algorithm, right? We're going to move one number into the correct place in this list, and then we're going to use quick sort recursively to sort what's on the left of that and what's on the right of that, right? So we take your problem, we break it into sub problems repeatedly. So we're just going to go through this one pass of quick sort, which is moving one number into the correct position. So that number that we're going to relocate is called the pivot. And for us, we just pick the last element as the pivot. So our goal in this process we're about to do is to figure out where the 14 belongs in this list. All right, so we have a pair of pointers. We have one pointer that starts here on the first element and one pointer that starts on the last element right before the pivot. Okay, so start here on the left and we're trying to find things that are smaller than 14 and put them on the left side of the list and trying to find things bigger than 14 and move them to the right. Okay, so we start with a 4, that's smaller than 14, so it's, it's in a good place. We go on to the 10, that's smaller than 14, that's good. 5 is smaller than 14, that's good. We come to a 20, that's a problem, because 20 is bigger than 14. So 14 should go somewhere to the left of 20. Okay, so we stop there, and now we start working from the right, and we're looking for things that are bigger than 14. And the first number we see is 11, that's smaller. Right, so that should be somewhere on the left side of our array. So these two things are in the wrong position relative to each other. So we go ahead and we swap those. So now our numbers look like this. 4, 10, 5, 11, 50, 6, 8, 20, 14. So that's our pivot. We'd gotten up to the 11, and we got into the 20. Okay, and we keep going. So move over, look at the 50. 50 is bigger than 14, that's in the wrong spot. Come over here, move to the left, look at the 8. 8 is smaller than 14, that's in the wrong spot also. So we want to swap those. And so now our list looks like this. All right, and now we continue from the left. So we look at the 6, that's smaller than 14. We look at the next position, and we collide with our other arrows. So now we know we're done. And at this point, we take our pivot, and we swap it with that collision point. And we get our final version of this list. putting a box around 14 and the box says 14 is in the correct spot now in this list. And we know that because everything to the left of 14 is smaller, everything to the right of 14 is bigger. So that's one pass of quick sort. And then at this point we would say, okay, all we got to do is sort this sub list and sort that sub list and we're done. And we do that by calling quicksort on this and then calling quicksort on that. So this is all the actual work of quicksort. So when we call quicksort on this, it's going to figure out where the 6 goes. And it's probably going to end up with 4, 5, 6, and then maybe 11, 8, 10. All right, so we're not saying anything about the sort order of this or that, just that everything here is smaller than 14. Everything there is bigger than 14. And so if I ask you to do a quick sort, this will be the kind of thing you want to do. I won't ask you to code it. <laughs> yeah? And then our next pivot would be the 6. If we're sorting this list? Yeah. 
the next pivot would be the 6. If we're sorting that sublist, the pivot would be the 50, and it's a really trivial quick sort. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> All right, good on quick sort. So other sorts, um, you know bubble sort, right? I don't have to go through that. Just think of the dancers, go around, swap pairs. Um, so insertion sort, insertion sort, so here's our input, here's our output. Insertion says just go through your input from the beginning to the end and put it in the right spot in the output. Okay, so we look at the four, that goes in the output, that's the only place it can go. Pick up the two and that should go before the four, so change your output to look like this. Pick up the five and your output should look like this. Pick up the one and your output should look like this, put it in before the two. Grab the 16, that should just go right there. Grab the 20, that should go right there. Grab the 8, that should go right after the 5, so keep the beginning the same, but move all of these things down and put the 8 right there, and there's your sorted list. So that's insertion sort. You're inserting it into the sorted place in the output list. Okay, selection sort. You've got your input, you've got your output. This says choose what you're going to take from the input in sorted order. Select in a sorted order, as opposed to insert in a sorted order. So go through here, find the smallest number, it looks like a one, that's the first element in the output. Go through, find the smallest number now, it looks like a two, that's the next number in the output. Find the next smallest number, that's a four, the next number is five, and so on. So I think of it as where are you doing the work? Here you're doing the work when you insert into the output. Here you're doing the work when you select from the input. Do you remember merge sort? So merge sort, you have two inputs, right? two sorted lists, and you're going to combine them into an output. And as we do this, all we ever do is look at the first element in each of the inputs. So look at the first element, here's a 4, here's a 3, which one is smaller? 3, put that in your output, take it out of that list. Now look at the first elements, there's a 4 and a 6, put in a 4, take that out. 5 and a 6, put in a 5, 6 and a 10, put in a 6, 7 and 10, put in a 7, 10 and 12, 12 and 14, 14 and 15, 15 and 18, 16 and 18, 18 and nothing, and then 20 and nothing. And we just made it onto the page. So if you have two sorted lists, you basically interleave them to create a sorted combined list. And to interleave, all you have to do is pick off the first thing from each list, take the smallest in this case, and add it to your output, and then remove it. What if you have large jumps? Like, you have four compared to three, but what if you had four compared to like a billion? So if this is like... Oh, wait, never mind, never mind. That's a dumb question. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a good question, actually. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, if this was really big, then we might end up taking all of this list and putting it into the output first. Um, uh, we usually assume there's no duplicates when we're sorting. If if there are, you just in this case it wouldn't matter. You could pick either one, and it'll it'll behave. But some some of these sorts you get edge cases with duplicates, so it's easier not to worry about them. Um, so that's how we interleave. Right, the full merge sort basically says split your list in half, merge sort the left half, merge sort the right half, and then interleave. So it's a recursive sort, it's a divide and conquer. Um, and the interleaving is sort of the last step. It says first give me two sorted sublists and I'll put them together for you. But where do you get the sorted sublists? Well, you cut your list in half and you hand it to a friend and say, can you sort this please? <laughs> right, and then you take those and you put them together. So it's another good recursive one. All right, and radix sort, do you remember that? So that's where you sort like character by character. So you look at your input as a series of characters and you sort um, starting with the, the least significant character, the rightmost character or bit. Um, it could be like ASCII code or the example we were doing. Um, you know, we were thinking of these numbers as three character strings, right? So we go through and we sort according to that rightmost character, which gives us 520, 421, 223. And then we sort according to the middle number. And we have to do that without changing the arrangement of things. If these are all twos, we can't rearrange these orders, right? So this doesn't change anything. And then we sort according to this most significant digit, and we get 223, 421, 520. Uh, let's see, bubble insertion, selection, merge, heap sort, quick sort, radix sort. Um, basic performance, um, bubble sort, insertion sort, selection sort, what's the order of complexity? For bubble sort, insertion, and selection, what's the order of complexity? Roughly. So those are actually n squared. They're the kind of slow ones. Uh, merge sort, quick sort, those are n log n. Oh, okay. So those, those are better performing typically. Um, but there's all kinds of edge cases. Quick sort is really horrible if your list is sorted to begin with. It goes down to n squared. Um, in a, a full-on algorithms course, you'll spend weeks just taking apart each sort and proving that it sorts and proving complexity and so on and so forth. So. But just know that there's there's differences in performance. Sometimes it depends on the nature of the data. Um, but usually, are these fancier ones merge sort, quick sort, do better. Heap sort's very efficient too. Heap sort, you take your data, turn it into a heap, and then just pull stuff off from the root. All right, I think that's 222. Um, I mean, we, we covered a lot of other things, but I think those are the main themes. Yeah? Um, was there a deca cards example for one of the sorts? Um, I used a deck of cards for merge sort. I actually used it for selection and insertion also. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, just kind of doing those things. Um, so things you should be prepared to do, we kind of already talked about these, but it's basically two sets of things, writing or modifying or, or analyzing code, right? And then doing um, these kinds of manipulations that we've been doing all quarter. Um, so about half and half. Um, I made copies of the AVL balancing algorithm, so I'll pass those out with the exam. Um, you don't have to put that on your notes, but you can if you like. Um, 
Any other questions here? All right. Some of the questions on the exams? With some of the questions <laughs> on the exams, they are. Give us a little are, head start or a little study. Or um, so. Let's see. So it's it's a combination of these symbols, <laughs> <laughs> and I just rearranged them in different ways. So. So a monkey and a typewriter kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, we got 10 minutes. You want to talk about Java for 10 minutes? Because yeah. I know a lot of people have been doing things with Java, and a lot of people have been um, teaching themselves Java or waiting for spring. So, um,. Let's do this on the Linux server. So you can do Java on the Linux server. Um, so Java is, is very much like C in a lot of ways. The syntax, the language will look a lot like C to you. Things like, you know, if statements, for loops, while loops, variable declarations, int this, double that, um, is verbatim the same, semicolons at the end of statements, all of this stuff. Um, so, so if you wanted to write Java code, just knowing C, you can do it, right? You need to know how to make a main program because there's no arg C, arg V stuff. But after that, you can write C code in Java, okay? But it's not, it's not really the idea of Java to, to just write C code, um, but you can get there. Um, so how many people have, have any experience in any way, shape, or form with object-oriented programming or object-oriented concepts? So yeah, we, we bump into this. How many people here have used an Arduino processor? Right, that's object-oriented C, basically, the language on there. But it looks like C for the most part, um, but it's actually an object-oriented paradigm. Um, if you ever used Visual Basic, which was like way back when, really fun language, that's object-oriented. Um, when we say object-oriented, what we're really saying is, is um, you can write code just by using integers and arrays, right? Um, but we can also, in C, we can use a structure statement. And we can say, you know, this variable x and this variable y and this variable z, they kind of belong together this array of weights and this array of values and this array of names, they kind of belong together. So let's make a structure called item and we're going to store the weight of an item, the value of the item, and the name of the item. And now I can have a variable named t, temporary, and that temporary variable has all three pieces in it. And I can make an array called bag and it's an array of 100 items and each of those items has a weight and a name and a value, right? So extend that idea just a little further. And in addition to taking different pieces of data and putting them together into a single structure, let's also throw some code in. Let's say, you know, I've got this thing that calculates the value of an item per pound by taking the value and dividing by the wage. I only really want to use that with an item. I'm not going to call that from other functions. Every time that I use this function, it's really going to be, I want to take the, the value of an item, I want to divide it by the weight and figure out the value per pound. So take that function which does that calculation and make that part of the structure that we call item. So now item has pieces of data associated with it, but it also has code associated with it. Or let's build a binary tree so we're going to have an integer piece of data. We're going to have pointers to the left and the right subtrees. OK, and I have this function called height. And when I call height, I pass it the root of a tree. <coughs> the only time I'm ever going to want to use the height function is when I have a binary tree. So let's make height part of the node definition, part of what a tree is. So now we can do things like T node, 
So we've got data and we got pointers for left and right. But imagine we could add a height function as part of that structure. We can't really do that in C. But just imagine that we could. So now when we declare our tree, we could have something like struct t node my tree. And we can say my tree dot data, we could say my tree dot left, my tree dot right, but I could also say my tree dot height. And if I did something like this, it would say, oh, let's run this code called height, which is part of the structure. What do we run it on? We run it on my tree. So instead of saying print out height parentheses my tree, I could say print out my tree dot height. And it's kind of like this piece of code is a part of this structure. And if I have another tree called your tree, I could say your tree dot height. And I can treat it just like a variable, right? Here's my, my structure name, period. Here's the name of the field. But that could be a function or it could just be a piece of data. So it lets us take ways that we manipulate this data and bind them very closely to the data itself. And that's really, really useful because now if I pass my tree to a function, the function not only has access to those data fields, it has access to all the code associated with my tree. And it's like I'm taking this whole bundle of, of executable code and variables and pointers and all this stuff, and I can grab hold of it with just the name of this one variable. And I can pass it to a function, and it can do whatever it wants with those things. And if I want another one of these, I can just make a copy of this, and I got a copy of all that code and all that data. So that's, that's what we're going to call an object, right? It's like a generalization of a variable. A variable is just like an integer or a float or something. An object is like a structure, but it can also include pieces of code. And that can feel quirky at first, but pretty quickly it's going to feel like the only reasonable way to write code is to have objects, and you get spoiled by it pretty quickly. So that's basically where we're going to spend 223, and we're going to use Java primarily as our object-oriented language. We'll touch on C++ a little bit sometime during the quarter, um, but once you've learned some object-oriented language, the concepts translate to whatever language. And then it's like, you know, if you know C and you want to learn Python, it's different syntax, different rules, you need semicolons, do you indent, and so on, but the concepts are, are pretty much the same. So once you learn one object-oriented language, you can move over to other ones pretty painlessly. So we'll focus mainly on Java. Um, we'll start off like we do with C, working from the command line. So writing code with VI, compiling it with the Java C command, running it with the Java command. And then after a few weeks, we'll switch over to using some integrated <coughs> development environments. And we're probably going to use IntelliJ um, as our IDE. So. I see smiles coming from that. <laughs> um, so that's that's a fun environment. And then we'll get into all kinds of good things. Um, all right. So there you go, 222. All right. I will see you in 215. If not, have a good weekend, and I will see you for your exam. Oh, hold on.